Next Radio 2018 with Broadcast Bionics. Next Radio. Hello. You know what it's like when your, uh, your friend phones you? You pick up the phone and almost within seconds you know what the agenda is, don't you? You know whether they've called to arrange coffee tomorrow, you know whether they've called you for a chat, or whether they've called you because they're worried about something. Something's happened. Almost before they say something, you know what the agenda is because of the pattern of the speech. It's chiming, it's chiming an emotional chord with your brain and telling your brain what the message really is. And when those two messages are out of kilter, when the content and the tone are at odds, you know which you trust, don't you? You say to them, are you sure you're all right? Because you've detected something in the way that they are speaking. Here's another example. Uh, you're, on a, uh, you're on an aircraft. You're sitting there just before takeoff, and the, the captain comes on the uh, loudspeaker. You go quiet, nice and politely, and you hear their voice for 20 seconds. And you nod to your friend and say, they sound all right. They know what they're doing. You know, in, in 17 words, you have worked out whether that person is going to kill you or not in his aircraft or her aircraft. Do listeners judge us that readily as broadcasters? Well, probably yes, they do. When you turn on the radio and flick from station to station, you're making instant decisions about your relationship with the content and the way it's being delivered. Let me give you a few examples. There's been some research into radio drama plus news actuality. The brain can instantly, you'll be checking this in your own head here, instantly tell the difference between the two. No matter how good the performance, how brilliant the actors they will know instantly the difference between those two elements because it's all about this, uh, this authenticity thing. Laughter as well. Here's one for the breakfast cruise. Fake laughter versus real laughter. No end of studies into this. Instantly, instantly recognisable. Here's one that I noticed the other day when listening to a programme I shan't name on Radio 4. Uh, when you've got a, a, a two-way with a contributor who hasn't quite mastered that art of pretending to be making it up as they go along, and they've got the script. Now, the information is exactly the same, but the tone makes you not trust that individual because of the pattern of delivery. Interesting stuff. So, what's happening uh, inside the brain? I, I appreciate the irony of an ex-disc jockey standing here talking about how the brain works uh, with such uh, wonderful people in the audience as well. But uh, first of all, the, the ears. I mean, the ears aren't very sophisticated at all, really. I mean, they take in everything. They're a bit like sort of Google Home or Alexa. They're just waiting for cues. You can't turn them off. You know, that's why alarm clocks work, because you can't turn your ears off. And they're taking all sorts of stuff. They're not bothered. Roll up, roll up. All these sounds going in. The donkey work, of course, is done in the brain. And in the brain, they're trying to work out what's relevant and what's irrelevant. And again, you know this happens. You walk down a busy road, you hear lots of noise. Somebody says, Stuart, and you turn around because you detect your name amongst the noise. So it's picking out what's relevant and what's irrelevant. And as broadcasters, we have to give those relevant cues to hook people in. Come on in. I'm saying something that actually relates to you. So it's zoning in and zoning out. We've got the, the RAB on next, and they often talk about that in the context of how we zone into radio commercials, which are actually uh, relevant to uh, what we're, we're thinking about buying or not thinking about buying. So we... We zone in to the content. The first thing, or one of the first things that the brain does, is ask the question, have I heard this before? Do I recognise this sound? You know what it's like? You're watching telly, the doorbell goes on the television programme, and you go, whoa, because your brain thinks, it's time to go to the door. You know, so it says, have I heard this sound before? That's one of the first things it says. And if it has, it doesn't bother. If it's a song on the A-list, it doesn't bother trying to remember it again, because it's got it already stored up here, uh, thanks to the hippocampus. So um, how do we use this in radio? Well, we use it in familiarity as well. Why is it we like familiar songs? Because you make it easy for the brain. The brain already knows what's in there. And with oldies, I mean, oldies are classic. Whenever I hear Sloop John B by the Beach Boys, which is a wonderful track from the Pet Sounds uh, LP that some in the audience will remember, but you should do, really, work of art. Uh, when I hear that track, I don't think of hearing it last week on Gold, who probably play it, Probably don't, actually. But anyway, so I don't hear, think of that. I think of me, age six, walking to infant school with my braided uh, blazer on, really not wanting to go to school. And no matter how I try to get rid of that horrible memory when I first, the first chord of that song, I can't, because my brain thinks, I know this song, you're six. 
And, and it takes me back to that time. That's how it works. But we can use these skills with, with radio generally. This is why we use jingles, identification, signature tunes, voiceover, station voices, all these things, because they chime. The, the brain thinks, yes, I know what's happening here. I recognize this pattern of speech. And, you know, why stations upset their whole schedule when one presenter's off, I never quite know, because the brain loves this consistency of, of sound. Here's another trick. What is the colour of your front door? No need to answer because it's a very dull question. And the fact is, although it was a dull question, you answered it. Because the brain hijacks the mind. The brain cannot ignore questions. We started off with a question, the very first session from John Carroll from JFK, he said, anyone here like numbers? Okay. If, the brain cannot avoid answering questions. Do we make use of that enough when we do great radio? The psychologists say actually more than that. They say, once you're thinking about something, you can't think about anything else. So you as a broadcaster can make your audience think exactly what you want. What's more, once they've considered something, the propensity to act on that information is increased. If you ask someone about their voting habits, they're more likely to vote. Ask them about buying a car, they're more likely to buy a car. And this has all been statistically researched by people we should trust. So it's a very powerful device. So we've got visual memory and we've got uh, auditory mem memory. Which is best? Well, we know the answer to that, don't we? This is the conference we're at. It, it's, it's this auditory thing, which is absolutely amazing. With visual, if you want to remember something, you will stare at it a bit, and you'll remember it, etc. And you can stare at it as long as you like, really, to take in the picture. With audio, it's gone. The dog barks, the dog's barked, it's gone. So your mind, your brain has to be really clever in seizing those sounds. But it can bring lifelong memories from a simple sound. That's, that's an amazing gift of the, uh, the, the auditory, but the, the, the bit of the, um, uh, the memory that, uh, that does that. And that's why these uh, spot the difference things are remarkably simple, simple. Because the brain can't handle complex pictures. The brain likes simple pictures. That's all it can take in. You show someone a page of text, they can't take that in. Whereas in audio, the opposite is true. Our brain likes complex audio signals. So those complicated logos with a few notes, the more complex the audio, actually, the better it is remembered. Another couple of tricks. Here we go. Coffee. Jasmine. Perfume. Cinnamon. These are odour words. And what's happening in your brain is actually triggering the olfactory reflex. Isn't that amazing? So not only can we have pictures on the radio, as we've known forever, you can make people smell your commentary. Isn't that just amazing? And I want to finish with where Valerie Geller would rather I finish, stories. I mean, how many stories have we heard today? Valerie Geller started off her session with a story. Catherine started with a story. She talked about the, 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 the chap in the, and I remember the adjective, the crumpled jacket, okay? Storytelling. So we know it works, and everything's a story. You might think you're doing hot radio, you think, I haven't got time for stories. But weather is a story, travel is a story, everything's a story. The, program of the, 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 the summary of the next program is a story. So what's happening here is what's called neural coupling. And this is amazing stuff. You know when you relate a sad story to a friend, and you get emotional telling the story? Nothing's happened to you, but you've told yourself the story, and your brain is reacting as if you were going through it all over again, much as though you, you wouldn't. Your listener, if you tell the story correctly, will be neurally coupled, and their brain will do exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. What a powerful thing. So, I say to you, when you're making great radio, when you're making great podcasts in the next 24 hours, as you're doing it, and you're looking at the language and the presentation and the tone and the delivery, ask yourself, as I do this, what is the brain thinking. Thank you. David Lloyd, thank you.